A warm welcome to this World Wind Energy Association webinar, which is about broadening community power, how to attract and retain more women. Yeah, this is kind of, uh, on the one hand, the conclusion of a two-year project that we as World Wind Energy Association have been undertaken um, with uh, the conclusion, which we just published, um, how to increase the share of women in community energy. And at the same time, we want it to be also the start of thinking about how we can implement the conclusions and make it a reality so that this important topic of community power and the share of women, but I think in general, diversity of community power gets broader. Before we start, um, let me uh, just inform you that this is a public event, so we're recording uh, the webinar and the recordings will be published on our YouTube channel. So whenever you speak, whenever you switch on your camera, please be aware that there may other people be listening to you and seeing you. Yeah, we have a great panel of speakers today and we have scheduled two hours for the meeting and um, I would now like to start uh, with the uh, summary of the study that we've done the past two years. Uh, that has been a study which we've been undertaking in collaboration with the uh, North and Westphalian Federation for Renewable Energy and the Community Power Association of Japan. So I'm going to share my screen now with you. So, um, yeah, let me show you that this has been a project with many organizations also supporting it. Um, I've already mentioned some of them, um, in particular, of course, with a focus on German organizations where we did part of the research, but also in addition to the community power uh, network from Japan, also ISEP and some international organizations like the Global Women's Network for the Energy Transition and RAN21. Um, the two kind of main researchers which have been uh, undertaking this um, unfortunately cannot join us today. Um, Timo and Madeleine, because Madeleine is uh, going to have a baby soon. And uh, Timo uh, has now other, other uh, obligations today. So I'm going to present you now the conclusions. So can I go to the next? Starting with, uh, by saying that um, how and why we develop this uh, question, these questions and why we develop this project. Firstly, assuming and understanding that community energy, that means locally only controlled renewable energy is a precondition for a sustainable future because that is a precondition again for a successful uh, turn overall over to renewable energy. By definition, community energy needs to be inclusive. It needs to offer participation to as many members of our society as possible. And community energy needs to be democratic. What we found out in the first year, so we had a two years project. In the first year, we found we analyzed the shares of women in community energy entities. And uh, it's not been a surprise. And there were some indications from previous analysis, from scientific analysis, the community energy share or the share of uh, shareholders, female shareholders in Germany is 29% holding 27% of the shares. So the average share is a bit lower than the male share. Um, in Japan, and uh, I'm sure that our Japanese colleagues will go more into detail about this, uh, it's, it's a bit more challenging to find out the exact share because there are also many institutional shareholders, but the share tends to be even a bit lower than in Germany. So when we look at that, women are more than 50% of the population, but they represent only 29% of the shareholders. Then obviously that is not as inclusive as it should be, and we need to work on that. So in the second year of our project, 
we try to find out what can be done with scientific methodology to make more women part of community energy. So we try to target people who are not affiliated yet to community energy, and we ask them about their little bit general attitudes and their attitudes about, renew, uh, about community power. So we ask the first question, do you know a community power entity in your region? And then obviously what you see here is 83% of the women say no, while 69% only of the men say no. So obviously there is less information that has reached women about community, in particular, of course, cooperatives. Um, we ask the, all the participants, what prevents you from participating in community energy? And here we came to the main factors in the case of the women, time with 41%, time is preventing them money. They feel they don't have enough money to invest or take part in community energy. And the third is information. 19% say that they are not sure about how this all works, so they don't feel confident enough. And this is something that I would request you to keep in mind. 19% information. We ask the same question to the man. And here we have the same factors which play a role as, as kind of preventing the man from, but time, 35% compared to 39 with the women, money, 29 compared to 26%, and information, the women said 19%, the men say 10%. So there's obviously a difference here. Men feel better informed. They say they are better informed. They don't rate it as a, such a big problem. So we asked also, men and women, how do you rate your interest in climate policies on the one hand? And you see that is really, really big, very high interest and high interest, 87%. The same question, how interested are you in energy related policies? Here also we have 67% of the women who say very high or high interest in energy policies. Please remember that is this 67%. When we ask the women about their knowledge, how do they rate their knowledge in energy policies? Then only 2% say very high and 30% say high. So that's 32% compared to 67% their interest. And here it's the biggest difference between men and, men and women because 70% of the men said that they see their knowledge high or very high. I think this is a really important difference here and the, the most remarkable one and the biggest difference we found. That is something that really needs to be considered. And again, going back to that uh, question before, information is seen by many more, double as many women as a barrier or lack of information and, uh, with a man. Why would women participate in community energy? And this is also very interesting. There's a strong interest, obviously, but the factors that they rate highest is contribution to climate, environmental protection, to the expansion of renewables in general, social contribution, and increase of local creation of value. What was rated rather low is financial interest. That's only 30% which may not reflect the truth, of course. Some people may not admit that they want to also earn money, but um, for a communication strategy, I think this is certainly very important to see that those kind of more in the, in the common interest, those factors, they are rated very high. And then asking again the question, not do you know, but are you interested in investing in community energy? 62% of the women say yes. 34% haven't decided, and only 4% said no, which I think shows us that there's a huge potential. We have, like, let's assume Germany, a thousand cooperatives with, yeah, something certainly below 1 million uh, shareholders. Um, maybe Katarina knows the exact number, how many people have been uh, involved in community engineering in Germany, but there's a huge additional potential of people becoming, in particular, the women becoming active members of community power. So we need to see how we can enable 
also maybe empower uh, the women to be part of that and grow together, of course, with um, uh, the renewable energy sector. If the renewable energy sector is supposed to grow, then this community power must grow and then there must be many, many more women. So our recommendations or guidelines, as we've called it, um, the, the, the complete study is now available on our website. I will soon share the link also. It's not only in German. We published it, I think, two months ago in German, but now the English version is also available. Broaden and strengthen the general understanding of the impact of community energy. That's obviously important because this is the kind of information that is needed. Create dynamic forms of participation. We found also out that, um, yeah, in particular women, and we ask, of course, more detailed questions, they feel they cannot commit themselves, let's say, every week, five hours to be part of some board meetings. But if there is flexibility that allows, in particular, women to take part, offer low financial thresholds, obviously for women, it's more an issue than for men. But I think that's also for other groups which are underrepresented, for example, people with migratory background, yeah, people with lower education, obviously having also lower income. If there is a, a lower threshold and you don't need to start with a thousand euros or two thousand euros, then it's easier. And that does, especially the cooperative model is, of course, very um, interesting in this regard. As obviously, there is always a direct and concrete connect with social networks around you. That, that's why one recommendation is build alliances with other local stakeholders. For example, I mean, taking from my cooperative where I'm a, a, a member of the supervisory board, um, building an, a new alliance with the church and creating a kind of cooperative so that those, um, in particular, the women who are member of the church and they, they are, have confidence to that organization, they can also then, they understand that, okay, this is not totally new, but using this network to have more confidence. Strengthen direct and personal approach. That's very important, again, to build the confidence that is obviously necessary. Develop further social media activities. That is, was something that I, I also found somehow interesting, not only with regard to the, the, the main topic that we discussed here, but um, we heard from many cooperatives that they just use traditional newspapers, printed, actually printed newspapers. This answer we got in the year 2022, and some may not even have Facebook account or the, the website is only having really minimum information. And that is, of course, not how you can kind of show that you're open. So more open and gender-specific events is also something that we found out. That's also referring to the results of the first year. Um, some cooperatives which offer like a special day for women to learn about the wind turbines or whatever, that helps to attract more people to become part. Put citizen-oriented concrete communication the contribution to local climate protection in the center. Actually, one reason why we wanted to find out how this all can work is that we noticed that the climate movement is now so strong and it's it has many female faces. Everybody knows Greta Thunberg. Many women are really kind of almost dominating this movement. So that fits to what we found here that for women in particular, the case of Climate protection is important. It's really important for their lives. And when we can show as community energy that this is exactly what we are aiming at and what we're targeting, then that, of course, makes it easier to understand why it's a good idea to join. Aim for qualitative growth of community energy. The community energy is not like a big corporation aiming at maximizing the profit. That is also clear. Uh, but it's it growing together with the society. Growth, of course, we need expansion, but not growth for itself and not for maximizing profit. Very important factor, and let me explain that these guidelines now, of course, part of them are derived from the first 
year, but we all discussed them in expert interviews and also got that confirmed again. But in the first year already, we found a correlation when women are management on the management of the community energy entity, supervisory, uh, et cetera, that that goes hand in hand with more women amongst the shareholders. So if women are visible as representatives of that entity, that goes hand in hand and attracts more women. Of course, I think that is a very normal, um, that's a very normal um, kind of psychologically understandable, um, I don't want to say mechanism, but that women who see other women are there, maybe it's easier then to identify yourself with an organization. So I have here the, the again, the, the overview of the 10 recommendations, 10 guidelines. Of course, also important to mention, but this is not the main topic here today, is that the policies must be in place that allow community energy to grow. And that is a big issue, of course, in many countries. Um, maybe referring to that topic of the participatory, also kind of gender sensitive approach of community energy will make it easier to talk to policymakers as a door opener as well. Um, now, what I'm looking forward to hearing from our other speakers and to the discussion uh, later, what is next? How can we kind of learn from this and apply in practice how to apply those recommendations that indeed community energy becomes even more inclusive and more dynamic and can grow more, grow in that more qualitative way and take over its role that we need so urgently now to make the, the switch to renewable energy a success. Yeah, that is my part. I need to just stop sharing. And uh, yeah, say thank you for your attention. And if there are any questions right now, then please let me know. I see here there's one remark, not audio. I think others could understand me. Huh? Do we have any questions? If that is not the case, then again, thank you very much. And um, I will share the website where you can um, I'll do that in a moment. Um, and in the meantime, let me introduce our next speaker. And I'm very pleased that we have from our Japanese partners, three speakers. Um, one is Dangila. So I need to check that. The first speaker is Daniela Lasoroska. I hope that I pronounce your name well. Um, you are at the moment, I understand, um, re doing research in Japan about this topic. Um, and uh, you're originally from Europe, but I think uh, best is you introduce yourself, that you will present the results of your research in Japan amongst community energy in Japan. Daniela. At first, mm, uh, another warm welcome, and I hand over to you. Uh, thank you, Stefan. Thank you so much for your presentation, as well as for that um, introduction. Also, I thank everybody on the organizational team for making these, this event uh, possible. And thank you to all the participants. I realize it's very different time zones, and I'm so grateful that everybody um, decided to maybe skip some sleep or their lunch and <laughs> or their dinner. Uh, and make it here. So yes, I um, I am Daniela Lazaroska. I'm an anthropologist. I'm usually based in Denmark, uh, but now I have conducted uh, research in Japan. Let me share my screen here. Um, let me see my PowerPoint. Uh, can everybody see the PowerPoint? It should be full screen now, right? Yes, it works. It looks good. Yeah. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Stefan. So today I'm going to be presenting uh, 
my presentation is titled Aging into a Sage, a qualitative study of women's positioning and leadership in solar energy communities in Japan. This project has been financed by the Japan Society for the Promotion of Science and is hosted by the Aoyama Gakuin University in Tokyo. Uh, the project started in April and it will finish in December. So just short of nine months. The initial goals were actually to look at or to, to gather and analyze the quality of data on women's experience in solar energy communities, to look at their difficulties, their achievements, and what more specifically constitutes women's leadership. But as you're going to hear from today's presentation, this, this is slightly changed based on the kind of data I could gather. So I have conducted semi-structured interviews with 14 informants and nine of them were, were women, five were men, and most of them were between 55 and 65 years old, although the range varied. The youngest person was 22 years old and the oldest was um, 71. And I've also conducted two research visits, one in Fukushima and another in the Kumamoto prefecture. I work with the research assistant and interpreter as my Japanese is um, not excellent. And my previous research was in Brazil and Sweden. So I have thematic uh, experience of conducting research on renewable energy, solar energy communities, but Japan is um, a new ethnographic context for me. So um, I was inspired by uh, I was inspired to look at Aging as an Enabler by The Emissary, uh, a novel by Yoko Tawada. And that's a dystopian novel uh, portraying a post-disaster Japan where the old are left with potentially eternal life and exuberant energy. The young are frail and in need of caretaking and in an environment which is increasingly dangerous for their survival. So these narratives about the well-resourced elderly needing to do what they can to provide a better future for the coming generations is also present in the accounts of my informants, the people that I met. So the woman I interviewed for this project in their role as leaders of these organizations represented something new. Because since the 1960s, Japanese women have been active in various movements, which might differ in ideological orientation, but have all internalized the muttering or a motherhood tradition. So women have spearheaded activist movement associated with consumer rights and the peace movement and became visible in their anti-war, anti-nuclear and environmental activism. According to anthropologist LeBlanc, these full-time housewives have drawn on their experiences to insist on the value of home-centered perspectives versus a political economy that prioritizes economic growth over individuals' quality of life. And this is not unique for Japan. Drawing on work with activists in Appalachia, Bell and Brown found that appealing to motherhood confers moral legitimacy to activities in a manner unparalleled by positioning their claims as based on concerns for their own health or that of their community. And being an activist or saying that one is an activist as an identity is a no-go. There are multiple words used for activism in Japanese, such as undoka, which implies a 1960s kind of militant protests, katsudoka, drawing on the word activity rather than protests, and widely associated with community-based projects, and akutebisto, which is a loan word written in katakana implying work with NPOs. However, all of these versions are generally seen as too extreme. Um, furthermore, findings indicate by that by 2036, people aged 65 and over will represent a third of the population. An increasing number of people are opting out of marriage and of having children in Japan. These demographic shifts are affecting how people rationalize their social engagement. Um, and also it's relevant to highlight that the contemporary elderly or people over 60s in developed countries are found to produce the largest carbon footprint as compared to other age groups. So this is an important demographic group to keep an eye on. So how were my informants then classifying their actions if it was not as housewife or mother activists? Upon inquiries of, on women's interest in solar energy, or I asked, are women or would women be interested in solar energy? They, they replied that women are uniquely positioned to be positive about solar energy. 
They stated that it is through their bodies and senses that women gave insights about the well-being of their children and family members, about the state of their households and surrounding communities. Uh, and I quote one informant. For women, energy is the most important and familiar thing in their daily lives. If we can create a mechanism for citizens and women to get involved in energy, which is the most familiar thing to them, and make it look attractive, many women will be interested in it. Women who are in charge of household finances every day are very sensitive to higher or lower prices and to saving energy. Because when the sun comes out, it generates electricity very pleasantly while you're drying your laundry. So there was nevertheless a lag between being interested in solar energy and actually investing in it or becoming a leader of a solar energy community. When asked what made them good leaders, uh, it wasn't, you know, this connection between sensing the sun. What they highlighted is something they called an open communication style. So informants indicated that it was based on being able to recognize the position of the other and include it in one's speech. Um, and I quote, I feel that being a woman is merely an advantage. I believe that women may be better at open communication, not just speaking from their own perspective. Or as another informant told me, when I started working for the environmental field about 30 years ago, my older sister said to me, what do you call it, religion? In other words, I was told that you are doing something special, something that special people do. And it's not common at all. It's not normal. It was good for me because her opinion reminded me that I was doing something, what, that what I was doing was not normal. So I had to try to explain to people more. It wasn't my religion, but it was, it was a really important thing. So I tried to explain more clearly. But why do they need to be open, I asked. Or why do they need to be careful communicators? Because, as another informant stated, much is a stake. And I quote, we've seen many women who are much more radical. And in some cases, they cause unnecessary conflicts with private companies and local authorities, which are male dominated. I feel that such troublesome women are rather hindering the next generation of women's social advancement. So as we can see, the line between being engaged and being perceived as a troublemaker is very thin. My findings seek to support that aging is not decline. Women's employment has tended, or in Japan, has tended to be shaped as an M-curve, implying that women leave the labor force in their 30s and 40s in order to perform care labor for families, returning when children are age 15 or older. Upon their return, such as the following informant quote illustrates, some of them are skilled in code and role switching. And I quote, we need to do a lot of technical things to build power plants, but other employees specialize in that. And I have a lot of different jobs in the company, such as monitoring the power plants to make sure they are generating electricity properly and monitoring the income from the sale of the electricity. I also do administrative work, which I think is useful. And each power station has its own management company. I also play that role. And it is necessary to have a smooth relationship with them. So I do my best in that area. So these women have actually options to abstract themselves from the gendered and embodied experience that they claim to be central to other women's interest in solar energy, such as the daily care for the home and attunement to housework. As I have shown, tapping into the roles of housewives and mothers can be a way of conquering moral legitimacy to one's actions and visions. In the light of Japan's changing demographic landscape, these connections are bound to become more tenuous or, or reconfigured. Interlocutors stated that a woman's interest in solar energy was situated in, the, in their daily work and in the household. When it came to their own work as leaders, then they unrooted from this way of enacting their roles and highlighted the skill of being able to tap into the perspective of others. Most of my informants have passed their 50s. They have um, gotten to try out multiple roles of students, mothers, housewives, employees in different sectors. Aging conquers many material and experiential resources. They did not represent needing to perform active care labor in their daily lives. Thus, they could choose to use their time for a cause they saw fit. In conclusion, what have they been able to achieve? 
They've been able to carve out a space of action, not as collectives of women, but as individual women and still male dominated organizations. They maintain relationships and build alliances by being emphatic listeners that can incorporate the position of the other. The conundrum, nevertheless, is to consider conformity to normative expectations, gender roles, and appropriate communication styles as modes of asserting agency. According to anthropologist Hirata, when women engage with social issues in Japan, they are expected to perform a cheerful, friendly, and unthreatening femininity. LeBlanc writes that this is a paradoxical use of constraint and resistance to constraint. So what has been done and what could be done? I argue that primarily there needs to be, and here we over overlap in our recommendations, which I think is a good thing. Um, there needs to be a collective acknowledgement that women are a minority within these organizations. And then further modes, modes of actions need to be agreed upon. Quotas could be a way forward as Shota Peruya posits that the Community Power Association has made a positive example by implementing 50-50 gender balance for its two co-chair directors and 10 board members. Research findings from the USA and Canada's renewable energy sector affirm the positive role of peer mentoring for professional development. Peer networks of women in renewable energy in Japan could also be a way of attracting and retaining more staff and volunteers. I would add that it is also essential to work on a culture and binding of and accepting the census within these organizations and welcoming of diversity. So to increase the diversity of the managerial groups, these groups can consider possibilities for allowing part participants to partake in part-time roles or flexible participation. This will attract people who cannot be engaged on a full-time basis, such as young people, students, working parents, full-time employees, et cetera. Research by sociologist Higuchi indicates that many people might refuse participation in grassroots initiatives because they're afraid that there is an all or nothing attitude, expecting them to dedicate their full time to the cause. Women's participation in energy communities or lack thereof, furthermore, should not be reduced to behavioral change discussions of women needing to change their behavior to make more time to be more amenable or more assertive in order to be able to partake or be leaders. Finally, one cannot idealize how much can be achieved without generating discomfort. Work towards diversity and inclusion requires it. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very much, Daniela. That was an, a very insightful presentation, really very interesting. Also, after, I mean, I'm more, of course, familiar with the German data um, to, to see some small differences, but I think the general kind of uh, dimensions which are yeah, playing a role in this, they, they are quite similar. Um, do we have questions to Daniela at the moment? I mean, we can always come back uh, at a later point of time. And if there is no question, I would like to then um, go to the next speaker speaking about Japan. Um, and again, thank you at this uh, point of time, Daniela, for really very interesting insights you presented. And the, our next speaker, it's my pleasure now to welcome uh, Mrs. Hiroka Takahashi, um, who is working with ISEP, as I understand, for Japanese organization, but at the moment based in Europe and doing research here. Yes. So, Hiroka. Thank you for introducing Yes. A, okay. A warm welcome to you as well. And thank I'll you very much. And over to you. Okay. So, uh, let, me, let me share my presentation. Okay, so now can you see the full screen of my presentation? It's not full screen, but okay. <laughs> just presentation more, I think. Yeah. Is. Yes, now it's fine. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay, so um, hello, my name is Hiroka. Today I will talk about uh, the women employees in the renewable energy sector in Japan and Myanmar. First, uh, let me introduce myself briefly. Um, I was a student of Mr. Fulia, and I did an internship at ISEP. So uh, after my bachelor, I moved to Myanmar and worked at a solar energy startup. 
In 2020, I went back to Japan and joined the Ida Renewable Energy Institute, which is uh, for training future entrepreneurs and leaders for community energy. Ohisama Energy, um, Ohisama energy is uh, the facilitator of the, um, this uh, institute. So to prepare this presentation, I interviewed two former colleagues from Myanmar. Uh, one is a man engineer and another one is women engineer, yeah, both engineers. And there's a, um, one of my peers of Ida Renewable Energy Institute and a woman facilitator from Okisama Energy. So um, yeah, currently I'm, um, I'm taking my master course at Utrecht University in the Netherlands. Okay. Okay, so um, let's move on to the gender balance issue in Japan. Okay. Um, first, gender imbalance isn't a specific issues in the renewable energy sector in Japan. Providing a great work environment for women with children has been one of the biggest issues which the Japanese society is facing. So um, let me introduce an episode at Ohisama Energy. Uh, when the women returned from maternity leave, the male manager asked, um, asked the other colleague about how much workload can be assigned to her. He tried not to give her too much work, caring about her hard schedule of parenting and working. Then the colleague asked him to talk, her, to talk to her directly about what she'd like to do and how long she can work before they decided the working condition without, um, without hearing her opinion. Um, so if a woman uh, returns from maternity leave, it is usually difficult to continue working in the same position as she used to be. This situation will um, sometimes degrade women's motivation toward working. And so um, if you zoom in the energy sector, the gender imbalance is more prominent. Historically, the energy supply was uh, centralized by big companies after World War II, so energy wasn't a popular topic in a community for a long time. Um, the energy sector was dominated by men, and community energy inherited that characteristic to some extent, though the number of women is increasing these days. So community energy itself is still developing and the working environment is not fully developed yet. Um, the gender ratio is not um, so serious if you look at the company as a whole, uh, but if you zoom in on technical laws, uh, there was, um, the gap is pretty obvious. As at Okisama Energy, there are nine women out of 17 employees. However, um, the development and engineer department is dominant among men and women mainly working, on, working in the accounting, human resources and administration department. So um, what, is what, what is necessary to encourage women to join community energy? First, uh, it is important to ask about women's motivation and provide a flexible working environment, especially for women with children. Um, the conditions male managers offer might not match with what the women desire. So um, if the working condition is negotiable and flexible, more women with children can join energy community. Next, if the... Um, if the manager are open for including women's perspective in the business models, uh, it will be accelerate the women's participation. Uh, women can join the discussion how to improve the society as a whole and invent the innovative way to, how to uh, blend the solutions to solve the social issues and the renewable energy privations. Um, for example, um, you can, uh, yeah, <laughs> for example, Tajimi Energy, uh, one of the Japanese community energy, um, provides a family friendly electricity 
supply plan. If a consumer maker uh, contract with Tajimi Energy uh, um, to get electricity generated by renewable energy, um, the consumer can get discount tickets for food, uh, for food and one year supply of diaper. So um, this plan will make renewable energy more familiar to consumers. Consumers with, within the community energy, women are not women who are not interested in physics or engineering can contribute to develop those models based on women's perspectives. There are many important roles women can play, but their importance is not well recognized yet. Okay, so next let's have a look at the case in Myanmar. So the same as Japan, uh, yeah, I know, sorry. <laughs> the renewable energy market in Myanmar is still small and I haven't seen community energy in Myanmar while I was staying here, I stay there. So I will talk about the gender balance at the private renewable energy companies in Myanmar. Uh, the gender ratio at the company or uh, organization is similar to those in Japan. Uh, the engineer I interviewed, who has a five years experience in energy sector, said it is normal to have um, all male teams or nearly all male teams with just one or two women in, in technical roles. There are several reasons behind this. In Myanmar, there is a cultural belief that tough engineering fields are suitable um, only for men. So the imbalance starts from a very young age. The first major difference can be seen right after graduation with lows, um, with many female engineers struggling to find lows that have a field component. Without this field experience, they are the legated to desk work, desk, desk loads. Um, so there's another example, um, a female senior engineer was doing the site survey at, at one factory. She had to climb up to the roof and see if the roof was suitable to install the solar, solar panels. The factory people did, didn't let her climb on the roof because she was a woman. So this cultural belief reg regulates um, the woman to do her job. Um, this situation makes a, a promotion to management laws difficult. So, um, okay. So th there is also the sense that women will not want hands-on hands job. So you tend to only find women in the finance human resources, administration, and the logistics laws with, within renewable, energy, renewable companies, as the same as Japan. Um, the stereotype image lead, to, lead people think that women are weak, incapable of high-tech high things and lack of engineering skill, which are not true. Okay, so changing um, these stereotype images is the key to empower women to work in the energy sector and both um, top-down and the bottom-up strategies are needed. For example, it is important to have female managers. At the same time, having more women in these fields in universities and as their first or second jobs. Everyone should be involved in this shift in including parents so that they can empower their daughters, daughters more, uh, or elderly brothers should respect their sisters. So um, it is also necessary to have role models for male managers to emulate when in interacting with their female staff. Moreover, providing opportunities for students to interact, uh, to interact with the female workers to stimulate their interests. Okay, so, yeah. So in conclusion, gender imbalance in renewable, um, renewable energy 
energy sector is serious both in Japan and Myanmar. For both countries, it is necessary to change the stereotypical image that energy related jobs are men's job. Even women sometimes don't take it as an issue. Instead, they are granted as a character of the energy sector. So um, it is uh, also important to have more opportunities to stimulate women's interest in the energy sector from an early stage, for example, at the school and the university. Finally, um, improving the working conditions for women is uh, necessary. Okay, so this is the end of the, my presentation. Thank you for listening. Yeah, thank you very much for another very insightful presentation. <laughs> here even introducing another country, uh, Myanmar. And, and again, I found quite many similarities. It's not every factor that we mentioned in the main, uh, mm -hmm. in, the, in the introductory presentation was found here, but you also uh, found some of those factors which seem to be rather universal. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. Exactly. Um, do we have questions here? No, then again, I'm sure we come back to, to also the findings that you had. Thank you, um, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Moment. Thank you. And uh, then I would request Shota, Shota Furuya, who works with ISEP in Japan. And we've been um, doing part of that research also together. So Shota, you've been undertaking part of the Japanese research as well. So Shota, I hand okay. over to you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm Shota Huria from Institute for Sustainable Energy Policies. And I did some uh, interviews for this uh, report. And I, and this time, I maybe I don't have to tell, talk, uh, talk so much, not so much, because the Hiroka and Raniera uh, introduced uh, very important findings of their research. So I'd like to just highlight the most important finding from the uh, our research. Just one slide. Um, like um, the previous report uh, illustrated the quantitative uh, aspect of the Japan's uh, women in community energy, and uh, it was uh, very uh, simple conclusion that the uh, women is not so much represented in community energy in Japan. Then this time I thought how to change this situation. So then the the hypothesis from the previous previous report and other many published published reports, the quota system can be a, a way forward. So I asked uh, informants, uh, is, is the court system uh, effective in Japan to increase women's leadership? So <clears throat> then I did the uh, interview, interviews. Then this was the most important uh, findings. So the interview is always I realized that uh, the, although it was report, repeated, repeatedly emphasized in the individual interviews that uh, commitment brought in should be valued regardless of gender. So uh, then uh, in many cases, a kind of quota promotion in the sense of audition promotes people in Japanese, it's uh, was advocated, which uh, would help to gradually equalize the, the proportions between gender, even if not in a 50-50 ratio from the outset. This was the most important finding. So <clears throat> we would like to equalize or increase more women to play important role in community energy, but uh, people need a time to adapt the change. So we don't have to start 50-50, but uh, we need to increase the balance uh, by step by step. So I think the quota system in community energy could work 
uh, in Japan because so many uh, cases, uh, other sectors also uh, showed that it's effective. So, uh, but the point is that how 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 we can make the process or steps to uh, introduce quota is the point. So, <clears throat> so that's my findings, and uh, yeah, that's it. <laughs> Thank you, thank you so much, Shota. And um, the the idea of a quota, of course, that was interesting. Not didn't directly come up in, in directly in the recommendations that we presented. Um, it's indirectly there by the recommendation giving more visibility to women in positions which are leading the uh, the cooperative in, usually. So it's very interesting that you are in particular focusing on that. Of course, that would not directly help to increase the share amongst the shareholders, but as we have found out, uh, that may indeed lead indirectly to more women amongst the shareholders as well. Do we have questions here? Then again, thank you, Shota. I just, and, want, uh, yeah, I just yes. want to make a comment that Mm -hmm. Hiroka was my student in the university, and uh, I'm so happy about that she's doing very good job in her studies. And also, I I introduced her uh, GWNet to think about how the gender balance can be hard can be affect her study yours. So I think mentoring is very important for younger generations. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, there is no doubt. And uh, that is what we hear again. I mean, this is again referring to the same um, kind of aspect. Once there are people in leading position you can identify with, that will also lead, of course, to more of that kind of activities. Yes. So we come back uh, again to you later. And uh, now let's go to... Uh, another country, uh, quite late already there, Monica. My pleasure to welcome you, Monica Oliphant, who's been um, a lot of experience in solar energy, uh, most recently also the vice president of the World Wind Energy Association. And Monica, you've been very active in community power in Australia. And now I look forward to hearing from you how you see those findings that we have and what your views are from Australia. Thank you. I hope that I will not mess this up. Uh, oh, what have I done? I would say uh, it looks good. <laughs> well, I can't see it at all. Uh, oh, right. Am I full screen? Mm, yes, yes. Great. Thank you. So now I'm going to uh, give a viewpoint from Australia. And first I'll start off uh, with a quote from our report that found that in both Germany and Japan, women are significantly underrepresented, as has been mentioned in community power. And also found that uh, uh, the uh, in by comparing the German and Japanese community energy sectors, an international perspective emerges on how much the different social structures of the two countries affect the community energy sector and women's participation. So I wondered if there were initiator, initiatives that might be special to Australia. So the talk ta tackles why is community energy in Australia developing in a different way to Europe? And I look at it from a historical point of view. And are women significantly underrepresented uh, in community energy in Australia at a board level and in general? And I put in a disclaimer because uh, I don't have very many hard data and this is a personal 
uh, viewpoint. And I think that there should be a very similar survey uh, conducted in uh, Australia, as was conducted in G uh, Germany and Japan to get more rigorous results. So my historical uh, uh, look uh, wasn't all that historical. It went back to 2012, which happened to be the International Year of Cooperatives. And that was the year that I started having some interest in uh, community energy. And I gave a talk which said that started off that in 2012, Denmark had 85% and Germany 50% plus of their renewable energy generation that was owned by community members with programs mainly delivered by cooperatives, which I thought was amazing that such high numbers existed. And at that time in 2012, European cooperatives were already really well, a well-established concept. They had delivered developed over many years before when wind generators at that time uh, uh, previously uh, and commercial wind farms were comparatively small and solar PV was still expensive. So they had to uh, develop in a sort of different age. In 2012 in Australia, the interest in community energy and energy cooperatives was only just them merging. And there were many multi-megawatt wind farms already operating with megawatt wind scale generators and none manufactured in Australia. And PV prices were coming down, aided by feeding towers and subsidies. And there was little interest in establishing wind cooperatives despite a good wind resource. Most uh, co-ops were PV and uh, uh, now, in Australia, very little of the renewable energy generation came from community projects. So Australia's first large energy cooperative was Hepburn Wind, completed in 2011 uh, with two by 2.05 megawatt wind turbines and it won a WWEA award in 2012. And the general manager, uh, uh, Taryn Lane, a woman, was named the uh, Standing Woman Trailblazer in Victoria, State of Australia, in 2021. And uh, she was the leading light in helping to start the cooperative movement in Australia, uh, mainly because at that time she thought the Australian government wasn't doing enough in the end. Uh, field of uh, uh, promoting renewables. And currently, uh, Hepburn Wind has changed to Hepburn Energy, and uh, Hepburn Energy has a board of seven, uh, that includes two women, but an expert women's staff of three that are all women, including Taryn Lane. And, uh, uh, Hepburn Energy now includes solar energy efficiency and batteries. The only other uh, wind cooperative in Australia that I could find was in a place called Denmark, not the Denmark, but a remote town of just 2,000 residents on the south coast of Western Australia. And it started actually before Hepburn went to to mitigate uh, frequent power outages in the town. And they had a shared flow and it took 10 years to complete operation and didn't finish until 2013. With, and they had two 400 kilowatt wind generators that save about 50% domestic consumption and the whole community came out and, the, uh, and was very supported at the launch. And they have a board of five which uh, includes two women and uh, profit, profits go to the community. So going back to 2011, right at the start, uh, advice on community power in Australia was uh, given by the Community Power Agency, which supported community energy groups to uh, uh, start up and, and show them how to 
best way to operate and actually tabulates whereabouts in Australia community groups are. This currently has a board of eight directors, of which seven are women. And out of that was the Coalition of Community Energy formed in 2014, which conducts lob lobbying on community power and knowledge sharing and research and uh, establishing uh, uh, forums and, uh, and conferences. This has a board of six directors, five of which are women. And come to a, a, a third a, a group, which I'll, a third of which I'll uh, talk about, is Carina Citizens Own Renewable Energy Network Australia, which is a crowdfunding programme which I'm involved with. And it was established in 2013 by a woman, Margaret Hender. It has a female manager, a female chair and patron, which is me, and the rest of the board is about 50-50 male and female. It works in that uh, there is uh, zero energy loans given for not to not for profit groups and for worthy projects. And uh, uh, because they're uh, uh, zero energy loans, we give them five to seven years to pay the loan back uh, from the profits uh, that they, from uh, the savings, not profits, from the savings that they make by going from uh, fossil fuels to uh, uh, renewables and from their uh, savings on their bills. We have 47 uh, projects around Australia and uh, the, the money that is uh, uh, returned is put into other projects and we have 47 projects around Australia. We crowdfunded uh, $565,000, which uh, through the revolving farm uh, uh, was um, eventuated in a million dollar worth of total loans. We reached the million dollars worth of loans this week. And we, uh, Margaret Hendon and I looked through all the 47 projects and was surprised that almost half, just under half of the projects were introduced to Karina by women. Uh, we started with just PV only projects, but now we include getting out of gas EVs and energy efficiency. However, not everything is wonderful in Australia. Uh, of course, Australia's First Nations pe people, and in particular their women and girls, face experience similar to those found in the developing world. They are more vulnerable to the effects of climate change and environmental degradation since they are often financially deprived, have less access to education and are excluded from the decision-making process. A new body, First Nations Clean Energy Network has been established to address this. And this has a board of 11, four of which are women, which in Indigenous communities is not too bad. Uh, the rough hope findings for Germany and Japan, are uh, many of them are replicated in Australia. Women are not as well paid as men, have difficulty in achieving leadership or decision-making positions, are minority participators, participate on more, most boards, and have low visibility in STEM jobs. Community energy projects are poorly promoted, their value is not presented, and there's no cohesive community energy plan for Australia. Hence, community energy and enterprises contribution to renewable energy is small. In 2020, an independent uh, member of parliament, Helen Haynes, a lady, uh, launched in federal parliament a community energy plan for region uh, Australia. Unfortunately, it didn't succeed, but she will be trying again. Therefore, it's true in Australia, as in Germany and Japan, that it is fundamentally important that policymakers provide a framework that allows exponential growth of community power as a driver 
for the energy transition. So potential for future Australian community energy growth. Currently in Australia, about 30% of homes have rooftop PV and of about 41% of homes in South Australia where I live. Uh, Australia has the highest per capita uh, rooftop solar installed in the world, which is pretty good. We have a good solar resource. Till recently, greatest PV, uh, PV growth has been in the medium socioeconomic sector, uh, not in the highest as what is expected, uh, because it is in the medium group that people want to reduce their uh, power bills and in the highest uh, group they're not so bothered about bills and it is certainly so that in the lowest group and uh, renters is the lowest penetration of PV but of late because um, there is uh, uh, interest, so much interest in electric vehicles and batteries uh, the uh, high socioeconomic growth, people are starting to store, store more PV and prices of PV is going down. And uh, average size of PV on roofs is five or six or more kilowatts. And uh, uh, the government is giving more emphasis to renters and low income uh, people. So community energy related projects that are showing growth are virtual power plants and uh, they have uh, rely on having a good electricity retailer. And ANOVA, Australia's first community owned and renewable energy focused retailer uh, uh, and also first community owned social enterprise was established in 2015 and co-founded and chaired by a, a, a woman. But it has had some problems as I have all small uh, uh, retailers in, in Australia because of high energy prices and influenced by the war in uh, Ukraine. And they've gone in, and over has gone into liquidation, uh, their retailing business, but not their... Uh, social enterprise, community social enterprise. So virtual power plants are going to grow. So are things like solar gardens, soul shares, which I won't go into, and community batteries. That is the big thing that seems to be growing at present. And I just put a picture of the Yera Energy Foundation, a community battery, because I rather liked it. And uh, they're, they and others are going into uh, electric vehicle charging and uh, sharing. Uh, the Yarra Energy Foundation has an uh, expert energy staff of eight men and one men, woman, however, a board of two men and five women. So, uh, in conclusion, it appears that women may not be grossly underrepresented in community energy in Australia, but this is purely conjecture at this stage and more data is required. And historically, more recent developments of community energy enterprises at a time of cheaper PV may have some bearing on different development of women participation in Australia compared with Europe. It is rather, but again, more data is required and it's rather strange that the two states of Australia, Tasmania and South Australia, which have high penetrations of uh, renewable energy, Tasmania has almost 100% of hydro and wind and uh, South Australia has uh, coming on to 70% over the year and growing fast of uh, wind and solar, those two states have very small participation in community energy. The other states where there is more coal and gas, they have much 
higher participation. And I don't know why. And again, I'd like to see, do some uh, data research on this. Community energy in general, their projects are not growing very fast here. And it will definitely benefit by uh, uh, policy makers providing a framework for groove, growth. Women actually often drive this policy. Greatest areas of potential growth are rural areas, indigenous communities, end of grid, high rise, renters, uh, community batteries and EVs. It definitely would be good to explore what gender issues do exist in community energy projects in Australia and how many of the 10 recommendations that were found in the report are important in this country. There are probably many, but we don't know yet. So a good place to carry, out, carry on this useful discussion on women in community energy and learn from international reaction, interactions would be at the Community Energy Forum stream at the World Wind Energy Conference in Hobart, Australia, in May next year, 2023. And uh, it would be really nice if uh, you could all come to that. Thank you. I finish there. Thank you very much. And also for the, the conclusion at the end that we can dis continue the discussion at our World in Energy Conference indeed. Monica, that was a great uh, presentation. Thanks a lot. Also kind of, um, um, confirming some of those uh, um, recommendations. Like it's very interesting to see that uh, this first wind farm, and I remember well when we gave the award for it, the first community wind farm under the direction of Terran as a female leader, um, that obviously had an impact, uh, say, showing us that the visibility of a woman is obviously leading to higher shares from the beginning. Well, um, we, do we have any uh, a brief question for this now? Otherwise, thanks a lot, uh, Monica. And I know that our next speaker is a little bit short of time. That's why I would uh, now directly go to her. And uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome Katharina Habersbrunner, who is on the one hand board member of the uh, German um, Community Energy or Citizens Energy Alliance and also a part of Women Engage for a Common Future. Um, Katarina, yeah, thank you. So. come to you. Yeah. I hand over to you. Uh, maybe mm -hmm. you can, you're going to share your screen as well? Yes, maybe Monica, you, could you stop to share your screen, please? I'm trying to find out what, how, how to do this. I think in what? the top of your screen, you will see a, a button, a stop. Uh, stop sharing should be. Uh, uh, um, I can I can do that as you, well. You, would you close it? Yes, thank I you. <laughs> yeah, thank you very yeah. much, Stefan. Thank you, Monica, Hiroka, Daniela. So it's so interesting to be part of the discussion and to have this international perspective because now I have the feeling, wow our small world, <laughs> what we have, what we cover and uh, cope, but uh, it's great to share the experience. And I love your pictures, Monica, from the beach and from the wind turbines. So that would be also nice to have in Germany. And also congratulations you on your solar penetration in Australia, which is really great. And so it means that you really make out, make use out of the solar energy what you have um, and you go ahead with all the solutions and of course there is a lot of potential yes i will um i will share with you very quickly mainly um the tools um to talk about ship i think now you you, you see my screen Perfect, yes. Yeah. Okay, yes. So um, women in energy community, so it's great that you did the study, Stefan. It's really so important because, because what we see is um, we see a higher awareness um, on the topic of uh, women in energy and gender in energy. And before I start with my input, I wanted to share with you, there is a new publication of the German Ministry of Economy and Climate. 
uh, on the G7 countries um, on energy and gender. I will also share the link in the chat later. And since Germany is uh, this year the presidency of the G7, they did a study and we also shared some experience and also with Japan and maybe also for other countries, it might be interesting um, to see the insights what, um, uh, what the officials are reporting, what they do on gender and energy. That's the first point. And the second is just, well, here, what we see, it was mentioned by Stefan. So for our just and diverse energy transition, we need all. And the energy transition is not only a technological project, it's social, economic, political, and of course, ecological. And we have seen in the past, and also you have reported from Japan, Myanmar, and Australia, so it's still male-dominated, even you, we see a great development in Australia. Um, that um, the energy um, system used to be male dominated. And now we start with a decentralized renewable energy supply. And it's so important not to reproduce inequalities and uh, in, uh, unequal power balances. And so to focus also on equality, on a higher share of women, on gender justice. That is uh, just a short intro. And you also mentioned it. I want to say that, of course, it's very important to have more women in energy communities. It's also important to have more women in decision-making positions. Um, but we also, we have to think about why are women not as represented? It's because of the care work. So you have mentioned it also in your reports from Japan. It's because we don't include it, for example, in our big policy programs for renewable energy, for when, when we are planning uh, re resources and infrastructures. Uh, and of course, we have different needs because we have different genders. We have, we have male or female, so we have a different perception of temperatures, for example. That's the big picture. And it means that it's not only energy policy when we talk about the recommendations for policymakers, it's more it's health, it's social, it's work, it's job policy. And you mentioned already, Stefan, and you all some barriers. And it's just to categorize what kind of barriers, because sometimes we hear from energy companies in Western Europe, well, we would like to hire women, but we don't find them. They're not interested in management positions, for example. Yeah, I think that might be true, but it's not the whole picture. It's maybe it's, might, it's a structural barrier because of time poverty, because of uh, glass ceilings, because of uh, non-reconciliation of family and job, for example. But it might be what you have shown also, Stefan, about the awareness and the perception. What do I know about the energy system? What do I know about the climate change that women, they tend to underestimate their own knowledge and that might be a personal barrier. And we also, we have regulatory barriers. So we don't um, include gender in our overall policies. So, well, in Germany, in the European Union, we have um, uh, equality strategies. I have learned from the G7 reports that also Japan, Japan has an um, equality strategy, but it's not implemented and it's not cross-cutting to, uh, to all sectors. And the financial barrier, it was also um, stressed by you, Stefan, and it's a, it's a result of the of your report, it's because it's less access to financial resources, uh, what women have. So that is, um, that's a picture. And just to think, what can we do as actors, as stakeholders in energy communities, in our regional, in our national government? So which kind of barrier would we like to overcome? That, therefore, I wanted to show you this, um, this type of barriers. And I think that maybe might be similar what we did in Europe together with Rescoop and Antonia is also here in a joint project on energy communities. So we asked active energy communities about their barriers. Why do they not implement gender tools and why don't do they don't they include gender targets and uh, to push more effort to have more women on, on the management board, supervisory board, and the membership anyhow. And um, here we see that um, 
we see the main point is even if we see a higher awareness of on the needs of gender and more women, the main barrier is other priorities. So it's not yet in our minds. It's not yet um, on our tables on the top of the of our agenda that we should do more um, to have a more diverse um, stakeholdership in energy communities. We also see, for example, a lack of awareness in the management teams. That's also a big barrier. And so that is maybe what we have seen very nicely in Australia. So more women are active. So the more women become members and are engaged. And it's also a result of your study, Stefan. I think that's the point. And also a barrier is lack of experiences, a lack of good, uh, good practice. So it's great to share it today here. And also a lack of visible engaged women. So women as role models. So where we also know that we know uh, in the case women are engaged in energy communities, so they, more women will, will be interested because normally maybe it's really a big step to enter a universe, <laughs> to enter an energy community where you know you are the first, you are the only women. So a lot of, um, of groundwork needs to be done. And that's the main point here, just in the good, that's the good news that we have a lot of tools. So we have to check what kind of barrier would I, would I like to stress? Is it, for example, gender trainings so to provide arguments why it is so crucial to uh, to put an effort on that so it would be to to invite a broad uh, citizenship to invite also men not only women of course and um, to explain how relevant is a gender just energy transition about the big potential of energy communities about the big potential of gender just energy communities with more women in active roles, for example, that might be one tool. Or of course, it's also mentioned by you, it's uh, targets and indicators like the quota, to have quota um, for decision-making levels, to have um, a good uh, working conditions where you combine family and job. So that is also very important. Or what we also see is uh, communication. So a lot of, Communication in the energy sector is also um, full of male pictures of, ma of a male language of maybe some not, uh, not intended, but sometimes discriminative language and just to be aware on that and to use a gender inclusive language. So we could later on, I can share some examples to, to use that, to use women as visible role models and for example, to recruit actively women because that's also um, very important that it's women, they react differently when you ask, would you be interested to be engaged in an energy community? They think about the time poverty, they think about the family, how to combine all, combine all the duties. And um, so here they are, they have different decision-making structures and regarding the st statistics and men tend to agree earlier to, yes, I, I'm interested and just, I will try it. So just to take that in, into consideration and of course, policy and advocacy. So here, that is what, where we are working on, for example, um, SWCF in a joint project with, um, with RESCOOP, for example, USINA. So really to apply systematically the tools and also to show that they work. So for example, for active recruitment strategies to have more women in the boards. And here, well, there are policy st stages that would be the policy level, but because we also, we have to show the policy, how important the, uh, how important more women are for the overall energy transition in terms of workforce, in terms of acceptance, in terms of speed up. So that is, that might be a, a circle. And well, we had already a lot of recommendations. Our, I, it's the same, what you already have mentioned. And here it's, yeah, it's again uh, to summarize that we are at the moment with uh, more women in energy communities, overall energy communities, they show a big potential. So they are at different stage in different countries. We can exchange ex experiences, how to speed up the development and how to speed up the development of uh, social and gender just energy communities, because here we achieve a lot of SDGs 
because of um, less inequalities, because of more power, because of a higher participation. So, the, so in Germany and Western Europe, we experience that many pe more people in the energy communities, they have more resources, they have more money, they have more education, they get more information. So really also to, to target the whole society, so maybe also families with lower income, and to have to strive for more sustainability and overall the energy transition and the transformation what we need for climate protection for more equality and for to save our environment and our planet and here gender and socially just energy communities can have a big contribution thank you very much and happy to answer any questions yeah, thank you very much, Katarina. That was again a, a very, very insightful presentation, uh, showing us also the work that you've been doing on this. And I'm glad to see. I mean, we had the, the last couple of months we met quite regularly because the work you're doing, that work we've been doing, um, obviously kind of fits very well together. Um, I just before maybe asking about your your um, asking other speakers or the audience with the questions to you. Uh, I, I was wondering before, how many uh, community energy uh, shareholders do we have in Germany? Yeah, I, I checked it. Yes, I wanted to mention it. So overall, as you said, we have more than 1,000 energy communities. So not all energy cooperatives. And they have more than 300,000 members. So it's maybe I was a bit disappointed. I thought it it's might be at least a million. So, But anyhow, it's a starting point. And as I mentioned, Energy communities, it's still a bubble in Germany. So it's not, we, we, we are on a good way, but we do not reach the whole society. So as I mentioned, so we reach a certain level of the society and that's a big task and a big homework for us to do, um, to make, to have a better communication and to spread the idea. And I think that was also a result of what you have shown, Stefan. Which is quite amazing when you, when you think about uh, Monica presented how important community energy has been in particular in Germany, yeah. also in Denmark. And mm -hmm. so the, that really shows us that the potential here is really, really big. Do we have uh, questions now for Katarina? And Katarina, I know you told us from the beginning that you cannot stay until the end. No, I have to leave. I also shared my email address and mm -hmm. uh, also the G7 study, the link here. And yeah, happy to answer your question also via email or in the next event. And I think it's really great to have this exchange and the perspectives of, of countries like Japan and Myanmar and Australia. That's very insightful and eye-opening. Thank you so much. Yeah, and as already been mentioned, we, we may have a physical meeting if, if everybody wants to travel to Tasmania in, in May, that will be uh, for sure a focus community power and also uh, be happy to also talk about this topic of how making community power really inclusive um, yeah. and for sure we will do another uh, event in this format here That's so great. if there is no well it's a great invitation Monica super happy to, to travel to Australia so we managed to do it in an eco ecological way anyhow it's our solar plane or whatever but it's really nice. So it's a nice perspective, yeah. Yeah, the travel is still a bit challenging. That is true to, to such a remote place. Mm -hmm. I mean, far away, we shouldn't say remote, far away from, I think many of us are here in places where you can only travel to Australia by, uh, <laughs> yeah. by, by plane. Yeah, then thank you to you as well. Great, thank you. And um, in case you have to leave us uh, uh, a nice afternoon, evening. And um, I now need to see whether Antonia can speak to us because Antonia um, told us that she's been traveling and uh, right now uh, may be about to change a train. So Antonia, yes. are you exactly. with us? Yes, uh, it's a... Uh... We made it, we made it. I'm uh, very happy that uh, uh, against my traveling uh, plans, let's say, I, I made it, uh, uh, I could follow the very interesting presentation that uh, uh, the previous uh, speakers gave. Uh, 
it's good for us to also, I mean, for me personally, to get the different perspectives from the different uh, regions. Uh, and uh, now, in fact, talking about uh, sustainable mobility, I am, uh, I'm just coming back from uh, Croatia now, just made it to Brussels by train. Luckily, everything went smooth. Uh, Super. So, you yes, didn't cross yes. Germany then, probably. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> it was like uh, everything went smooth. Also in the German front. <laughs> oh, really? Okay, that's, <laughs> yes. That's yeah. unique. But let Quite me just briefly maybe mention yes. that you've been working now for several years for RISCOP, which is the global, I'm uh, sorry, the European umbrella for renewable energy cooperatives uh, as an introduction. And uh, we've, we've uh, already um, spoken together at events and you've also had a focus in your work on the gender topic and on women in the cooperatives that are also your members. Exactly, that's uh, uh, very uh, true. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction. Thank you very much for the invitation uh, on the, the first place. Uh, indeed, with Rescue PU, the European Federation of uh, Citizen and Cooperatives, we, we have uh, started uh, the work already a while ago. In fact, before I joined uh, the team, uh, colleagues of mine uh, had already uh, starting the starting the conversation, realizing that uh, uh, more or less uh, what you have also found in your research, uh, in fact, that uh, the women are indeed underrepresented uh, in the uh, energy uh, communities, uh, the energy. So, Antonia, I'm the afraid. energy cooperatives, and now we're talking also about the, the rescue EU, in fact. Yes. That was a small interruption, but please now we can hear you again. Ah, okay. I'm glad to hear. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I was just saying that indeed some colleagues of mine have indeed started uh, the the work, uh, and. Uh, Let's see, I hope that, because I see some notes, I hope that uh, the connection is back. I will yes. try to keep it short because I understand that uh, my network is not so uh, stable. Uh, mm -hmm. Then uh, I was saying that in fact, for instance, when it comes to uh, the uh, the director of uh, the, uh, the Rescoop uh, EU, uh, the, uh, okay, the, the official um, uh, uh, body, I mean the legal, um, a representative is a legal uh, entity, uh, but uh, we have, like, for the physical people uh, in, for, uh, in responsible for representing it, we have two people of different genders. So our president is uh, uh, maybe you know the Brazilian from EcoPower uh, is uh, male, and then we have uh, Nuri from Som Energia, uh, the female. Uh, a representative also taking their role, so we try to balance it. But then, as Katarina was saying earlier, uh, previously, uh, a very successful project, I have to say, we were working on was the European Citizen Energy Academy, and there we had a very sp particular uh, focus on gender and very specific KPIs, which I think that this is something that we should always have in mind when we work on the topic of uh, uh, renewable energy and even more on on community energy to really try to get specific also uh, when we uh, uh, set the targets and always have them uh, in mind, keep in mind the issue of gender from the beginning, from the get-go and not later on just to add something gender, let's say sparkles uh, at, at the end. Uh, so with uh, uh, Yusina, uh, we have been uh, trying to uh, indeed like involve more women uh, and generally trying to um, uh, get uh, their, their perspectives and their ambitions uh, more visible. And then in the context of uh, this work, particular work of Yusina, we in fact, as Rescue PU, uh, we also started a, a gender power working group uh, where we, in fact, uh, we invite our members uh, to gather uh, once every uh, two months and uh, discuss particular issues that, that they might be facing uh, when it comes to this gender just uh, uh, operation, gender just uh, uh, overall energy community and uh, in their activities overall. Uh, 
Um, and we are, uh, in the context of this, we have also developed an ambition statement uh, where we, we also set, let's say, uh, the, the floor with what we want to achieve uh, uh, through uh, this uh, uh, um, gender power working group. And uh, there we also have some more uh, fixed, let's say, goals with uh, particular deadlines and all, overall also uh, some more like uh, open um, um, measures, let's say, that we wish to already start applying. And I, I want to now, as I'm going to uh, try to close my introduction, because I'm not sure about the, how, how well you hear me. I apologize for this. Um, I want to go back to what you were asking uh, when you started, okay, how do we actually apply? Okay, we, we get the lessons, but how can we apply all this? I think that, uh, in fact, what we should be doing is uh, one of the things that we have to be doing is to try to uh, involve also uh, a, a lot of uh, people of all genders, in fact. Uh, I was about to say males, but in fact, people of all genders in this particular conversation we're having. Because sometimes I feel that uh, this uh, gender topic, uh, for a reason, remains as a, a, a topic uh, for uh, women, and I'm very happy that I see that uh, uh, from your organization, it's you, Stefan, really taking initiative uh, to uh, coordinate and organize these kind of uh, uh, webinars and publications. Uh, so that's one thing that I think is critical to make the topic uh, to give uh, the present. I mean, the, the to share the pres the importance of this uh, uh, present situation and the uh, the thing start the discussion about what needs to be done with everyone and not only with the people directly, uh, let's say, uh, affected by this being excluded. Uh, in fact. Um, then uh, I would say that uh, another thing I, I heard about the issue of, I mean, the, the suggestion about um, uh, introducing the quotas. And this is something that I also learned uh, that quotas may be useful, but they're also a, a bit of a dangerous tool to uh, apply. This uh, is something that I, I learned from my colleagues from uh, WECF, in fact, because by uh, applying this kind of quotas, the women that uh, uh, can be involved might, in fact, feel that uh, they're only there because uh, of uh, their gender and not because of their skills and experience. So I would, in fact, uh, close my um, uh, introduction, let's say somewhere here, because I would like to, in fact, invite uh, also the previous uh, speakers to, and maybe also the participants overall, to start the discussion uh, about uh, this uh, topic and maybe also uh, overall to start the conversation about everything that uh, we have been uh, discussing um, from the beginning of the webinar. Uh, once again, thank you very much, and I hope that next time I will be in a better position to also share like a proper presentation and without all the background noise that uh, I hope that you don't have too much of it. <laughs> thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Antonia. And uh, we do appreciate that in spite of your situation that you still agreed to share your views with us, which is very, which is very much appreciated. And, and thanks a lot for appreciating also uh, kind of my role as a man being part of this because we, I even got once the feedback that you as a man, why are you kind of dealing with this? Or do you want to kind of teach us now how, what we need to do as women? Uh, which I think it's, is also fine and uh, we have to, to deal with that. But I, I, I totally agree that this is more than just a binary question, but it's about, that's what we are emphasizing all the time, making our energy supply and the economics behind it just much more inclusive so that many more at the moment, it's in particular the women who are underrepresented, but at the end, it's a, it's a, it's a general debate about uh, social justice. Um, Antonia, I'm also glad to hear that you have a working group on gender justice now at ISCOP. And uh, it's very good to see that these things then are really getting uh, done in a, in a structured way. Do we have any comments or or questions from our audience, from other colleagues here, for Antonia.
that seems not the case, then again, thank you at this point of time, Antonia. And uh, I'll be happy to continue the discussion also beyond this webinar. Again, you're also, of course, cordially invited to join us in Australia. But actually, our offices are not so far from each other. So look forward to continuing this, this discussion um, in one or the other way. Then let us go to our last speaker for today. And it's my pleasure that we have also someone from the Americas, um, Andrea. Andrea Krei from Canada. It's my great pleasure and uh, also uh, to introduce you as uh, like Monica, and I'm also very happy that we have now also stronger female representation on the board of the World Wind Energy Station. You are one of our vice presidents working now for many years in Canada for renewable energy community power, also on issues like gender and also with indigenous groups. That's been mentioned by others here as well, in particular, Monica. Um, Andrea, now I hand over to you. Thank you, Stefan. I'm going to try sharing my screen here and um, bring you into some um, slides that I have. So um, can you see everything on my screen? Yes. Perfect. Okay, perfect. Wonderful. So good morning, everyone. I'm in central Canada, um, and so I probably... Uh, a bit of an island here <laughs> with everyone else, but um, it's wonderful to participate in this. Um, I am speaking to you um, as um, a practicing professional woman in community energy. And just to give you a little bit of a background, um, as a professional engineer, and while I was doing my um, graduate studies, I started my own company. And um, this was because I found the evidence in the research and the need for community power 15 years ago. So, um, and my company is called CORE Renewable Energy, and I called it CORE because the CORE stands for Community Oriented Renewable Energy. So from years ago, this has been the foundational philosophy of my practice, but also in my research and my work, because it is so empowering and so important to see communities take leadership in their energy transition. Now, as we move where we are today um, into more open discussions around gender equality, diversity, and inclusivity in our workforce. It is exciting for me to have this conversation as a woman practicing in this field, um, having been oftentimes the only woman at the table, and still to this day, um, that's still quite common, but it's important to have these conversations. So thank you for providing this platform to do so and for participating everyone here today. So I am going to try and slide change here. Okay, so we found, uh, and I encourage everyone to go to the, the WEAR report that, um, that Stefan has um, shared today and why we're here, because I'm going to talk about the findings um, a little bit from a Canadian perspective and a little bit from my own experience and share as much as I possibly can to provide insight in them. And so I've just listed them here. We're going to go through each of them um, very high level. So some of the uh, electricity workforce stats in Canada right now show that the renewable energy sector is going through an unprecedented time of change. A lot of organizations are facing this fundamental shift in their business model, but there's this greater demand for innovation, performance, and the labor market is changing. Uh, personally, I have a lot of um, women ask me about their inquiring about this industry. They're very interested and in general, um, very concerned and they want to make change, but I don't believe they have the tools yet to do that. So there is a gap that we have to get through there. So within that context, um, a focus is accelerating on the advancement of women into leadership ranks and it is gaining momentum, but there are still gaps. And a lot of this data has come from a recent study from the Electricity Human Resources Canada's um, uh, research data, and it really aligns with what the WIA report has also shown. So that's what I'm going to focus on today. So some of the current research showed that the women's representation around decision-making tables in industry is a primary focus, and we need to, to see what's happening there. Do we have women in leadership? And overall, 30% of board seats in the sector are held by women, but they're not evenly distributed. And among the 61 industry organizations that were consulted and researched, only 12%, um, pardon me, 12% have no women on their board and an additional 11% have only one woman. Now we're going to get to why that's an issue right away. Okay, so previously research had shown that if one woman was on a board, um, that was kind of okay, but we know it's insufficient. We know that the research showed that that's insufficient. And the business benefits of diversity 
are unlikely to be gained if we don't have enough women on boards. So based on those numbers alone, about one quarter, 23% of the boards in the electricity sector in Canada are missing out on the advantages of a more balanced perspective that, that we can bring to the table. And this is really an important part here. Research suggests that when members are only one woman, um, they can face challenges in getting their voice heard and sometimes they're only seen as a token. So it's really important to have more than one woman at the table. I'm going to give you a personal story here. So um, as um, CEO of my company, and, and this is years ago where I was developing a solar project in um, a manufacturing industry, and um, I was the only woman at the table with the construction um, workers, with, with men at the table, young engineers. I'm an, a senior engineer. And um, one of the young male engineers failed to do their job properly. And they were outside. It was nothing to do with me at all. But being the woman at the table, all the men looked and turned to me and said, well, what's the problem? You fix it. And I said, I, it wasn't even my responsibility. So that really led me to have a fundamental shift in seeing how we need more women at the table. And that I have a philosophy and a practice now that when I go into meetings, I will always bring another woman with me if I have to make that decision so that we have more diversity at the table, especially if boards or other places don't have that and take that leadership. So we may at this time of transition need to take that first step in that initiative to really step forward and, and bring other women. And it doesn't matter necessarily that they have certain qualifications or expertise. It's just the fact that having more gender balance at the table will change the tone of the meeting. So consider that when you do go into boardrooms or go into a meeting as a, the only woman, or perhaps if you're an ally to women, we have to show women being more visibly responsible, but also that comes to role modeling. Because when we bring another woman to the table, not only do they see what you're doing, they believe they have the capacity to reach for that as well. And that's really, really important in this transition. So make sure that we bring allies to the table and it may, and they, and when I say allies, it's men and women that support women, but also anyone who presents as, um, as a, a female gender, women gender. So um, keep that in mind, okay? So this go goes in alignment with the finding from the WEA report about making women more uh, visible. And some of the statistics I have on the page here really show that, um, we don't really have a lot of women on boards in the sector. Um, that's the first figure on that. Hopefully my little arrow shows up on the screen here. And that we need to have more diversity in executive teams to make the decisions, but also the roles, the roles of women um, in those boards and positions. We are not seeing a lot of them in president and CEO roles or or other parts that's very low. So um, a lot are, sec are in the HR and IT, and law, but we really need to have more women come into um, leadership positions as well in there. So let's go to the next point. One of the things that the Electricity Workforce Stats Canada showed in the results is that a more gender inclusive executive team and board of directors can actually produce better results. Okay, so that's that's amazing, right? So we're having more diversity, we have better results. And these benefits show stronger access to talent and critical st skills better compliance with regulatory requirements and stakeholder expectations, enhanced innovation and competitiveness, improved retention, increased safety track record, and lower strategic risk. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the safety part, because this is an important um, thing to consider that I've also um, verified with a colleague of mine, another woman, uh, who developed one of Jamaica's first largest solar plants. And when I interviewed her on my podcast called Fem Power, um, she told me, and, and you can listen to the episode if you like, but she told me that the development of this project, what was critical about it was having more women on the ground. And they found that their safety improved in the project because women take better care. They're, and this goes back to what, going back to some of the comments that we heard about women having more of a caring caretaker role, both in the home but also in the practice, in the field. And that's a, a, a benefit that we really need to bring to the table when we do energy projects, because safety and um, protection in developing the projects and uh, building the projects is critical so that we can actually have success of the project. We don't want injuries, right? And so that's amazing to me to actually see this in the results here and hear the story from a colleague of mine in the field doing a community project on a remote island in the Caribbean 
and having that same finding. So um, true story there. Okay, we're going to move on. Some of the characteristics of women on boards and executive teams show that we have an aging population. We have boomers. So what's going to happen if we're 55 plus? We need to bring in more youth. We need to do a lot more training and we need to have a better balance across that um, the plan because we have to have succession planning in these projects, especially with community projects and what we're learning. Now, I'll give you a little uh, tidbit on that. So about 15 years ago, I, um, I was the first woman in my province here in Manitoba to develop a community-oriented renewable energy project where I was working with two community groups at the scale of a 300 megawatt wind farm. And we we're the first to do this, to take utility scale projects and have community power models applied to them. And we set precedent in developing the business structures around that and how to actually move that forward. And I can tell you that the two uh, leaders of the cooperatives, the presidents were both women and they were both 55 plus. They were very successful at moving the projects forward when they had the leadership. And after their leadership had changed and we did find that um, we moved to either like one kept a woman and one moved to a man, there were definite dynamic changes in how those boards functioned as community cooperatives. And so there were definitely struggles. And some of the men would say, oh, we need to bring the, we need to talk to the lady, we need to bring her back because there was more dy a dynamic um, and also connected way of the way she integrated her community in that cooperative. So subtle um, subtle differences like this are not often quantified, but they have been observed. The other part is ethnicity. We're seeing a lot of Caucasian um, people on the boards. Uh, the educational level, a lot of them have advanced degrees. Now, this as an academic and also working in academia, developing educational programs to advance uh, knowledge in a remote uh, energy and energy security programs, particularly for Indigenous communities, I can tell you a lot of students don't have advanced degrees, but they want to participate in their communities and help in their Indigenous communities back home in that energy transition. So it's really critical to be able to establish education programs that help vulnerable, marginalized, and um, minorities access education that they wouldn't necessarily be able to access otherwise, because we do have the will and the drive of people, but there is a gap to get there. And that is often tied to um, the financial aspects of being able to achieve that as well. So not only do we need the programs, we need the accessibility and affordability of those programs for, for people to access them if we want to see um, greater momentum in the change in the tr energy transition. In terms of field of study, a lot of them are these professional areas. So we're talking about engineering, business, law. That's not what we only need. We need skills. We need to have skills development. We need to work with on the technician level, on the installation level, and also develop trades. So there's another gap in that area that I've found in my own work and see in my practice. So as we are working to, um, you know, help get to that executive level, we also need the support, the boots on the ground, and help on that level of advancing knowledge. And um, in terms of professional certifications, having accounting professional and other designations, professional engineering, um, we're seeing um, numbers around that as well. Okay, let's move on. So the second part is really, um, this one's an important one that uh, in the finding of the WEA report about creating transparency and understanding about the work of community power companies. Uh, working with Indigenous communities, working with community power for years, community power concerns itself with community ownership. And we have to decide and around that definition on that community ownership. Um, oftentimes we want to see at least 50% ownership, but that doesn't always happen. And it depends on the financial model and also the participation of the community in that ownership model. And so there's um, some work that I've done in that area we can go into another conversation separately on that, but definitely know that there's a broader scope on understanding that, but also community development and capacity building around energy generation and sustainability is important to be able to have, have that transparency and um, understanding of what actual community power is. So moving on to three, ensuring innovative forms of communication, strengthening direct personal contact. So we want to build an enabling future and to create a workplace leaving behind these antiquated ideas of what work should be. 
but we have to understand everyone has different needs. And what's really important is when we want to communicate and have women participate in this workforce, we have to offer flexible benefits, packages, flexible work arrangements. And it's more than just flexible policies. We need to enable um, respect, uh, enabling respect individuals and invest in their development. We don't want to leave women behind. We have to have programs where staff members train each other and share that knowledge and create that network. So leadership development is for all current and future leaders. It's really important. Now, senior leaders have to be accessible. They have to be accessible not only to um, their immediate work force, but to all staff. And that means being able to talk to anyone and share that information and have an open culture. Um, this shows a commitment to having that enabling culture. We don't wanna see toxic workplaces um, and we'll get into a little bit of why that's an issue shortly. And this is where good leadership makes a difference. So we want to facilitate women's development. If there's an opportunity to see someone really taking interest, you don't wanna stunt that. You wanna really encourage it and help it flourish. That takes um, a really aware, leader to do that. And there are times when you will have to decide when that's not happening or if things need to change in your organization to um, remove blocks from women's advancement. If that is removing a leader who is not enabling, you have to take that step. And um, oftentimes that's hard in cultures, in, in, in institutions and in different workplaces, but it's an important point to remove blockages. And um, there's not only one model of leadership, uh, it's not a one size fits all. And it's really important that um, we match to women's personalities as well. We've often found, I, and I myself being in um, a male dominated field, find that we can never really fully truly express ourselves the way that we um, want to in some cultures, in some places. And as I've worked in different places uh, around the world from North America, South America, and Europe and around there, the the way women interact is different in the different cultures. And that's, I think, an important place um, to take note of how we can possibly adapt um, of, of how we can facilitate more meaningful interactions. Okay, so the fourth point that we report showed was about social media. Now we're seeing a, a big transition to communicating on social media. I use it often to share messages and let people know about um, what I'm doing or what is important in um, women's role in leadership roles, but also in the energy transition, and also um, to uh, make sure that we get the message across on the right platform and to choose those platforms wisely on how we communicate because um, women are very sensitive to uh, if a platform is very masculine dominated, will they want to have their message or will their message be heard or will it be filtered by certain algorithms, which is a big concern on social media. So um, there's a, a subtle way to, to navigate that and that has to be done very strategically. In creating networks and action alliances with other local stakeholders, we have a st some statistics here um, from the HR report that I mentioned earlier. And that is really that, um, women's workplace experiences often differ from their male colleagues. And this is where I wanted to get to um, creating safe spaces. And um, what we've found is that in the survey respondents, one of every five women, that's 20%, re reported that they had personally experienced harassment, violence, or bullying in their workplace at least monthly, if not more, and in the last five years. And that is very unfortunate and it it needs to stop. I can tell you personally, I've experienced that myself and it is um, is a very, very difficult, serious problem. And this is in stark contrast to only one man in the sample of saying once a month, maybe. Um, so women are experiencing in more frequency and in um, uh, uh, quite a lot more often, but also uh, the depth of that and how that can stunt the progression is is very uh, serious. We need to look into that and make sure we're creating safe spaces. And that progress starts with awareness and creating um, a safe place to, for, for women to function as women do. Um, now, constructing financially lower threshold entry points. I mentioned this earlier. Yes, it can be very expensive to get to an advanced degree. Education costs time and money to enter. And what we're seeing now is that we have mature students wanting to enter into this who perhaps have degrees that are unrelated to the field. So creating programs that help them find entry points into the industry is really important. Having support systems, funding and scholarships that can help, but also flexible work arrangements 
because a lot of people who are coming are coming from industry into education, but that they're still tied to industry. So in industry, they have to have flexible work arrangements to learn as a working professional. And education, these institutions are often still operating in a bygone era, and these need to become more flexible as well. And um, though that comes back again to policy, but also to the disruption of the current institutional models. And we'll be seeing more of that coming in the future. So access to education in the sector is really uh, an important part to focus on because we need to develop the skills and then deploy to industry. And this has to, again, be accessible and affordable for mature, marginalized, and vulnerable students. And again, now, once these tra people transition into industry, perhaps like myself, um, when I started my business, um, there were no specific funds that helped women start up. It was literally doing the work. We're in a position now where we can have a voice and say, look, we need to have specific funds to help women lead in businesses and get into industry and into market and compete and be competitive to compete. Um, so we need to find ways and mechanisms to enable that. Creating dynamic action groups and forms of participation to maintain flexibility of people involved. Um, yes, this is very important. We need to have effective gender inclusive policies and practices um, because we need to have that minimum standard for a well-managed organization in today's industry. And they have to have meaningful impact and outcomes. They have to be implemented with awareness, commitment, and consistent leadership behaviors to actually drive that change. And flexible work is key to this. On the eighth part, forming open and gender specific events. So I put up a chart here and we don't have to go through all of this, but this is some of the findings. And even though we have um, certain sector groups like women in renewable energy and women in science and engineering, there'll be networking conferences and events that also engage men and women in these um, places to have these conversations as we're also gonna be having in Australia. Um, but we also have to have cr cross sectoral events so that women can learn as well as men from what happens in other sectors and bring that knowledge into our industry for success, as well as role modeling. Role modeling is essential. And that goes back to having that woman in the boardroom and other women involved um, as much as possible to show what is possible. And what I found really interesting here is that if we look um, uh, under the green uh, section here where it says women answered yes somewhat, I spend time with senior emerging leaders, women leaders to understand their perspectives. So we could see women are not really doing that enough yet. That's why we need to have these gender specific events. We have to have more the voice of more women uh, on those webinars, on you know, on the platforms in conferences to talk about what they're learning about gender equity and, and so on and so forth. And we need to also have measurable outcomes of, of what that um, impact is. And so this is how we're going to empower concrete com communication and getting close to finishing here on a couple more points in the WEIR report. What we see is that communication will build this awareness and the understanding of conscious and unconscious biases. And this helps teams to be stronger. And oftentimes when I've had these conversations and really been pushing the envelope both in academia and in research on EDI, meaning equity, diversity, and inclusivity, a lot of the men are not aware of the biases or they'll take the training and they will still, they will not have um, changed. And that's a real concern because they continue to maintain these biases as if a switch did not actually change. So the question is, how do we actually shift that paradigm? It's not enough to just take a, a bias training. We have to put other mechanisms in place, other checks and balances, and we need to be able to have allies that call out poor behavior. And that means men who take that leadership role and are not afraid to say, well, you know, um, I, I something's not right here, or we need to review something. So it's important, important for men to also use their voice when they are aware of um, other biases. And I don't just mean men, but any allies of women, women and men, of course. Um, and it's important to communicate uh, in a ways that includes people from other ethnic backgrounds and genders to bring that balance. We need to start with workplace education. We need to have a talk about being respectful and stepping up when you see something going wrong, as I mentioned, and build on selecting people that are considered trusted tradespeople in fields and crews to build that confidence on the ground as we, we have it throughout the whole spectrum, not just in executive boardrooms, but actually where we build our projects and in the communities, having leadership in the communities. And so when we put qualitative growth into the center of attention, which is one of the other findings, um, what's really important here is that we see 
organizational leaders and managers are doing these great, great things here, taking actions, creating a workplace that is respectful and welcoming. But when we look further down into what male managers are doing, they're not doing enough of promoting the ability to balance work and personal life. They need to do more of that. This shouldn't be at 32%. It really needs to be um, a lot higher. They need to be championing and defending gender initiatives. It cannot be at 24%. Again, calling out bias or inappropriate behavior is only at 17%, and challenging gender issues in workplaces is at 14%, and celebrating and encouraging women is at 22%. So these really fundamental, important things should not be this low. So we need to see improvements on there. And so I'm going to leave it at that because I think I've, I've taken up enough time. But um, uh, yeah, if you have any questions, please feel free to, um, to reach out. Yeah, thank you so much, Andrea, for really doing a, a analyzing this in depth. Uh, really great, great work that you've done, um, kind of on top of the work that we've been doing in in those two years. You've also, like uh, like some of the others here, uh, Monica as well, um, Katarino's already left, given some input when before we published the study. Thank you for that as well. Um, Shota, of course, I should mention here as well. Um, so um, that was really kind of uh, for also from your your Canadian perspective, but also I think some some more general uh, additional kind of um, analysis to what what I have presented. Do we have any questions from our colleagues here for Andrea? It seems that what we're here presenting, discussing is not so controversial. Um, and there's a lot that I think uh, fits together. We heard now really uh, from very different parts of the world when we look at Australia, uh, Europe, Japan, Canada, um, but still there's there's a lot that I feel uh, these these different presentations have in common. Um, if, Andrea, if I, if I may, ask you after you now listen to and you you listen to those other presentations before uh, you spoke um what what is your impression when we uh, hear from japan from australia and also from european colleagues um do we have a common basis here to work on this together or is it more kind of too much uh, still um, cultural aspects involved that we may not kind of fully or enough take into account I think we definitely have something to work on. I think we're we're hearing similar stories. There'll, there'll always be a cultural influence, right? We cannot negate that culture is an important part of uh, developing energy systems. I think we are sharing similar stories and I think uh, we're learning from each other. And it's been fascinating to hear what is happening. Also inspiring. Um, I feel a little bit like I sit on an island out here by myself. <laughs> There's community projects going on, um, but they're not often driven by women. They're not often driven by um, women with advanced degrees and knowledge. Um, oftentimes, it's community on the ground, people who are just neighbors and, and getting together. And that's fantastic. That's what we want to see. But we need to come together and learn from each other across our cultures as well, because um, what Monica has brought and, and what our Japanese colleagues have shared today as well is fascinating to me. And um, I think it uh, it just adds um, so much more to the story, but it also emphasizes the importance of this work. Indeed, yeah, I, it's it's fascinating. Huh? So we we hear different angles, but it's interesting to see that yes, there is a lot of common substance. That's how I feel it. Um, so we certainly can take it take this message from today. Uh, do we have anybody else who would like to comment on this? I'd be interested. Daniela, are you still listening? You still with us? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I'm here. Yes. Because you are understand you've been doing your research on uh, the um from an anthropological uh, perspective, maybe that's your the, the way how you started mm -hmm. looking into it. Uh, now what uh, we just discussed, Andrea and I. How would you see that now as you also compared several countries and you have experience mm. that you also worked in Brazil? Is that the yeah. cultural dimension something that we should focus more on or uh, what's your kind of takeaway from today? 
Sure. I mean, I did conduct a similar project in Sweden with energy communities. So I also have my own direct material, which I could make some kind of comparison on. And indeed, there are some similarities. Like when I spoke both to people in Sweden and in Japan and asked them about, you know, like the further involvement of women, there's always the reply that we're not interested in more women. We just want to have more people on board, you know, but like I don't know so much about marketing it's not my speciality but I do know if you want to have more people you have to sort of communicate a message that uh, communicates particularly to that group right like people need to mirror themselves in, in something in order to to be appealed by that right so that's kind of a universal but for example there's like very obvious differences so in Sweden my informants they didn't have a problem in calling themselves so activists is not a, such a popular word in energy communities but more in terms of like el chad which means uh, fire soul you know so there will be a word for this which kind of resembles activists but like as i presented from the japanese example it's it's definitely not about who you are as an identity it has to be about the thing you're doing, uh, which is more renewable energy. So from that respect, I think like having this awareness is important. You know, like I think in Japan, for example, my findings were that people didn't know what this is, you know, but they also didn't know how to classify. Classify, what does it mean? You know, what what am I doing if I apply for this kind of activity? What What kind of like, how does that signal to my community, you know? So I think just just like maybe finding a way to like communicate it in a, in a culturally appropriate way, which doesn't make it seem threatening, you know, which won't make you seem like you're doing something that's very radical if that's not what you want to be doing, if you understand what I mean. So there's, yeah, just having an awareness of, as you were also saying earlier, like to communicate this in an appropriate uh, or like in, in a way that it can can seem appealing to different groups, I think is important, like the findings of your report as well, which is not the same thing in different places. I mean, maybe in Sweden, it's interesting to be an ill or like a, a fire soul, but that's not the case in Japan. We call it in, in a concrete way. In, in and connect with the net networks, local networks, which I think touches upon this as well. Yeah, thank you, sure. Daniela. Would anyone else uh, here uh, like to, to make any final uh, remarks, kind of concluding, not final conclusions, of course, but uh, um, anyone? Monica, would you like, I know it's really late in, in Australia, but if you'd like to, to make some final comments, I'd be happy about oh. that and also conclude then our webinar uh, uh, just, actually it's quarter to two in the morning here oh, wow. <laughs> so my brain is not very uh, uh good but i i've really really enjoyed this uh, uh presentation and to hear what's uh happening in different parts of the world and i think that that is So I think there is a connection problem. Okay. Ah, that's funny. I think I dropped out for a moment. Yes, it said recording stopped and recording canceled. So I, I won't uh, hold up people more, but I think that this is a good initiative that we should uh, expand and get more data in, uh, and uh, interact more so that we can um, make sure that uh, both women and men work together successfully in community projects. Thank you very much. I think I take this as the last words. Thank you so much for staying awake very long. Also to our friends in, in Japan. Also to those in the Western Hemisphere who got up early for this. And yeah, I think it was a very fruitful discussion. And uh, I really enjoyed hearing from 
all of you. Uh, I wish you a nice day, a good night, wherever you are, and hope to see you soon again. Bye-bye.